Hello and welcome to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast, a show about life adversity, how to overcome it and transform your life. This is your host, Dr. Lidiana Garcia, a licensed psychologist in Los Angeles, California. And even though my hope is to deliver information that can be helpful for you to overcome adversity and transform your life, it is not meant to be a substitute from being diagnosed and treated by a licensed mental health, medical, and related professional. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of the second season. Today, I have the honor and privilege to introduce you to Dr. Christine Rivera. She's part of the Latinx therapy community, and I met her, and I am so happy that I'm not alone in this journey, that there's people that kind of look like me, speak like me, and are in the psychology profession. And she specializes in infants, so that's perfect for the second season. So without any further ado... Here's Dr. Christine Rivera. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Like Dr. Lidiana said, my name is Dr. Christine, and I'm a clinical psychologist who works with children and family. One of my specialties is working with children ages zero to five, and typically I get most kids that are struggling with either a developmental delay of some sort or a behavioral challenge, or sometimes it's both. So what I do is work with the children and the family to help support that child's development and kind of get to the root of where the behavioral challenges are coming from. Children always do the best that they can. So I usually include the entire system that's working with the child. So that typically will include like a school setting, whether that be daycare or other caregivers that are involved in the family, as well as the parents and any other system that the child is involved with. So you really, I really take the time to look at the behavior in each setting that the child is involved in to see where the problems are coming up. Um, I also do a lot of parent coaching, and this is typically like, how do we deal with tantrums? How do I deal with anxiety of being a new mom? How do I deal with postpartum depression? For new dads, it's also a transition. So how do I deal with this feeling of wanting to be a good dad, but my dad was really tough on me, but I want to be a little bit softer, but I don't want to be emasculated. Like these are a lot of feelings that often come up. So I work with both parents and a lot of couples as well with the parenting piece. That's so important. And when you say like behavioral, can you speak a little bit more? I know you mentioned tantrums. What other behavior do people usually seek you for? For the zero to five population, it's usually like crying spells that seem really intense. And I don't necessarily classify that under tantrums because there's like a sense of panic in it for the child. So that feels really different. Another behavioral challenge might be like not wanting to eat or only eating with specific, like I've had cases where like only grandma can feed child and the kid will only eat with grandma or something like that. So then there ends up being a lot of anxiety around feeding times. And that can be really hard for a lot of moms because you're really trying to just nurture your child. And that piece has so much meaning to it. So we work around that a lot as well. Yeah, but so I would say the behavioral components can literally happen anywhere. There's just so many different classifications for it. Kids are so interesting. <laughs> As you were talking, I was like here like already like analyzing, ooh, the grandma, that must be something systemic and all that. But then as a mom, I went through like, I can understand that part. Like I remember my son didn't eat like solids well until like 16, 18 months. And mm-hmm. I remember like me feeling like I'm cooking all this healthy food and blah, 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 and like organic. And then the food going to waste was so frustrating from mm-hmm. the other side. So I can definitely relate to that. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what got you into this work? So originally, I, I didn't know this was a specialty for a long time in my training experience. And then I think it was my third year of graduate school and I got placed in the specialized foster care unit at the Department of Mental Health. And they had a zero to five track. And all of us got trained in kind of all of the tracks because it was a lot at that site. So that's where I learned how to do the intake. It's called the eye care for ages zero to five through DMH. And it's really heavy information about all of the developmental pieces for that child. So it really, I think that piece really helped me think about the importance of the development and where if we were to be plugged in at that point, how helpful it would be. So what I'm trying to say is that A lot of the time I got referrals for like six, seven, eight year old, but it felt different when I could be plugged in at like a two year old experience of having a developmental challenge. 
because then we can provide the service for the child, provide the resources for the parent, and we can address it as soon as it's starting. So I think that experience really impacted my interest in this population. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I can see how you can see changes earlier. I mean, as long as everybody's working together and everything and they're following through, but you can see definitely changes way faster. Yeah. And then I, because I became interested in that, I I started to look for more opportunities. There weren't that many in graduate school. Like you had to kind of like really look for it and figure out who your mentors could be and really seek them out. So then I ended up doing a fellowship at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I did a one year training there. And that's where I got a good chunk of more of the assessment of early childhood and also kind of got more specialized training in the coaching that I do. That's nice. Yeah. I see in the eye care. I used to work for his contracted agency. <laughs> so long. Ages or so. Yeah, it's super long, but it's very, I was so happy to see that they were so thorough in their assessment for the zero to five because they would ask questions that parents would be like, why would that matter? Like how's the feeding and all those kind of things. And you'll be like, that matters a lot. Mm-hmm. It was not that basic, like, what is your son or child doing? And, you know, what you've done, like, it was very thorough. So mm-hmm. I like that whoever created that within DMH had that more broad aspect. Mm-hmm. And yes, that whole zero to five. I remember when I went to grad school, there was no zero to five class. It was child development. And that's mm-hmm. it. It was no, so it, I also kind of bumped into it when I moved here in LA and I was able to see people working in special, such a beautiful yeah. specialization. Thank you. Okay, so what is the infant stage? The infant stage is categorized as from birth to about one year. And so if you think about when a child is born, what are they really doing, right? They're just really pooping, peeing, sleeping, and crying. That's what it looks like, right? But actually what is happening is that they're kind of bombarded with so much stimulation. So a large part of this infancy stage is just learning how to self-regulate with all the stimulation that is coming at babies. So I would say that that's the main function of those first like zero to three months. They're really relying on the parent just to regulate or usually during this period, they're not really differentiating between adults a lot yet, um, but they're really just needing the comfort of a calm adult to help them take in all of this. They go from being so warm, safe in the womb to being outside where there's bright lights and sounds. And a lot of things are unpredictable, like if an ambulance drives by or if an airplane flies overhead. Um, So I I feel like it's really, it's a really different environment from being in the womb, right? And so a lot of what they're doing at that time is just learning how to be. Yeah. And that word self-regulate, well, you guys have heard it in the second season a lot, but how do you define it like in your own words? Yeah. So the way I would define it is, I mean, we can start with like how I define it just for myself as an adult, right? So I stay self-regulated if I'm anxious by taking deep breaths, by staying grounded, by reminding myself that I'm safe and that I'm okay. When I feel like something's off, by asking for support, that kind of thing, right? So self-regulation is the act of being able to take care of yourself and comfort yourself and soothe yourself. Again, that's something that's taught And that's something that we learn as we grow. So a baby who hasn't had any experience is needing to be taught this by their caregivers. So we need to help support the parent to also be self-regulated in order to co-regulate the baby. And that is such a big, important piece, what you just said. Mm -hmm. Supporting the parent to regulate themselves because the children is just mirroring a lot of feeling it is more like energy wise kind yeah exactly verbal communication is not necessarily what the parents say i'm okay i'm okay but they're like i'm okay i'm okay i'm okay and they're frightened <laughs> the child is feeling like wait this is like even like gaslighting in a way you know it's like wait you're saying you're okay but your voice sounds like all this kind of thing so i think that piece is so important what are some of the struggles that you see the most in parents like with an infant yeah I think some of the parents that I've worked with, the biggest struggle is the transition. Pregnancy and birth is such a big transitional period for the family. So when a woman becomes pregnant, okay, this baby's coming, we have to prepare. And there's like this nesting stage where you're preparing your home and what it looks like. And also it's like 
oh shit, what am I going to do with my job and all these responsibilities? Like, how am I going to manage all of this and still make money? And still, like, you know, there's like so many things coming at you. And like your thought process is probably like all over the place at that time. Similar for the dad, like the, or like if this is a traditional family, right? But similar for the other partner where they're just kind of figuring it out, what this new system is. Once the baby is born, it's all of that planning. How does that play out in reality, right? So a lot of the time, parents envision a very specific life, right? When they're pregnant and they're about to have, and almost always new parents is like, I never thought I would be this exhausted. It's always the first thing that you hear. Like, I don't remember what sleep feels like. So I think that the biggest struggle is a, of course, the exhaustion, but also the transitional pieces of what is our life like now? And how do we like, so that we feel like we're in a good place and we can move at a good pace and we can like trust each other and know who plays what role right now. That is such a hard one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it usually never is how you expect it. It's so like most things, right? Like, yeah, I feel yeah. like with everything you, you like daydream about what it's going to look like. And then it's like, oh, shit, this was a little harder than I thought, you yeah. know? And it's something that is still being like idealized this whole mm-hmm. piece of pregnancy and everything and babies. But a lot of people are not speaking the truth and honesty. Like lately I've been seeing more of a movement of that, of, of new moms kind of being like, oh my God, this is what reality looks like. And, but a lot of others don't. So then they feel like, and now with social media, then they feel like, wait, what's wrong with me? <laughs> like, what's wrong with me and my child? Yeah, a lot of posts are about like being like realized as a woman for being a mom and how it like brought so much more meaning. But then there are moms who are experiencing really severe postpartum depression or anxiety. And so that just feels more and more isolating because they're not able to share that. Or if there's like a sense of guilt and shame around having those feelings of that are not ideal, right? Like that, that are not like, oh my gosh, this is the best experience of my life. And it's always going to be mixed. Like it'll be really great and it'll also be really hard and it's okay. And we can hold both. It's just, how do we hold both? And from the infant perspective, what do you think is that they struggle the most? I know they cannot speak, (laughs) but yeah. And it's so interesting that you said that, that they can't speak. I also work with a lot of kids on the spectrum, right? And so the hardest thing is not being understood. And I think it's the same for infants where it's just like, again, all of these things are coming at you and you're trying to regulate in these new environments where there's so much stimulation compared to what it was like in the womb. And it's like, these adults need to understand me and I don't know if they're understanding me right now, right? So I think that's the hardest piece for an infant. And also, a lot of the times, if a parent is really anxious, the child is going to feel that energy, right? So I think that one of the biggest struggles is figuring out for the parent how to stay calm, but also for the child, how is the child going to communicate that that's what they're needing in that moment? It's not that they they need to be fed or changed or go to sleep. It's just that they need a calm presence. So what are some of your favorite techniques to help manage these struggles? Yeah, some of my favorites are doing breath work. So taking some deep breaths and really tuning into your body and your experience. We can be bombarded with thoughts a lot of the time. So breath work really helps to slow that down. Also saying things that in quotes you're not supposed to say out loud in a safe space, I think is really beneficial. So a lot of the one-on-one work that I do with parents is saying those things out loud and just validating that experience, that you're not alone in this, that you're not alone when you say that you're anxious or this is harder than you thought. Or some clients have said that the experience or they've said things like, I just want my body back. Or like, I, I miss when my body was just mine, right? It's a, it's a different experience as a woman to share your body, to be a catalyst for someone to be born and also to be a feeding source for somebody. So saying these things out loud and really processing what they mean and how we can integrate who who we were before motherhood and who we are after motherhood is something that is the most healing. Yeah, I can see how that can be the most healing part or one of the most healing, like being able to share things yeah. like unapologetically, like raw and however it comes. Because yeah. a lot of times they don't have anyone to go to. Mm-hmm. If they even talk to a friend. They might go like, be grateful, like you have a baby, you know, all those kind mm-hmm. of, and go in in that route. And then they start feeling like guilt and shame. Because now I feel like 
the whole issue with infertility or issues that you know miscarriages i feel like it's increasing but i don't know if research would say that but i know a lot of friends that have gone through that so like sharing sometimes like how hard it could be then you might feel like but i'm not being grateful or yeah if I, i do have a kiddo that i was able to bring or maybe you're thinking about my child is neurodevelopmentally you know like normal and you know all those kind of things and so there's all this kind of shame that is out there yeah that's so true and really i feel like as women there's a sense of competitiveness that is just kind of a part of <laughs> growing up in this society right and i think that's something that we also have to grapple with and we're not here in in any way to compete with each other really like what we need the most is support and sisterhood and i think that that's something that i also recommend and provide groups for that because i think that is often one of the most powerful pieces of finding your support network is just finding other women to connect with and other women to support you that is not just a therapist who you're confiding in who like it feels kind of secretive sometimes right for some women going to therapy for the first time but if you're in a group with women then it feels really powerful and it feels really safe yeah. so that's also one thing that i i really recommend to new moms and it, it doesn't need to be a clinical group if you just have like a mom group where you're just hanging out i think it can be really helpful yeah that was the piece that helped me the most i had a very informal mom group we even call it mondays the moms group or something <laughs> yeah. and we would like alternate places like homes to meet and sometimes we were having like in the morning like a little mimosa with popcorn with chocolate and the kids there all playing or i mean all laying in the floor because they were like four months or yeah. little things like that or little outings and it was so helpful like going to eat sushi and all of us with all the kiddos you know stuff like that and it was so helpful because i was able to feel that i was able to share very raw about the whole experience yeah. and feeling heard not having to be this perfect mom yeah mm -hmm. and any other techniques like specifically maybe for an infant that you've used or yeah i've been for an infant i think that with the parent coaching that i do what i like to do is go during the hardest time of the day and do like live parent coaching in the home if we're able to do that and so really it's just taking some deep breaths or figuring out what's going to help you calm down when there's a panicky scream happening i mean you've heard a crying baby right your mom it feels like an emergency every single time right especially when it's new and you haven't been around a lot of babies it's just like oh shit what do i do what do i do like how do i make this go away and you just want it to stop So really working with parents in those difficult moments to calm down and say like okay let's look around everyone is safe your baby is screaming which means that they're good you know we would be more worried if they weren't screaming or if they were super quiet you would want to be checking up on them so figuring that out and figuring out that you're okay and they can cry and you're still okay and they're still okay and then let's go see what's going on we but I think that That's one of the most important pieces with infants just so that that panic piece isn't there. For whoever is listening, this might sound like a simple thing, but I can see how it's so profound. And like I mentioned in other episodes for those that are don't have children or are just listening to this from a reparenting purpose or view, just think about that. How your parents maybe struggle with you crying and how that has impacted you because What you're saying is so profound. I don't think people might necessarily be grasping on it, but that whole aspect of the child being able to know that they can cry and it's okay and the parent can be like not welcome necessarily, but like be a container for them mm -hmm. and still be regulated. Oof, you're talking about self-regulation down the road, about attachment, like secure attachment. Maybe down the road they'll feel like they will be able to express their feelings because right. the mom or the dad, you know, the caregiver is able to contain it and be there no matter what. Yeah, exactly. And that's how we develop secure attachment, right? It's that our parents continuously are able to attune to us and meet our needs. And if they're not, there's some repair after they are not able to meet that need, right? And so all the parents that I work with have really great intention. And so they're able to do that. It's just a matter of figuring out what do I do with that initial anxiety that's come for me? How do I regulate myself? So we can use the picture of the airplane where 
you have to put on your own breathing mask before you put on your child's breathing mask. It's the same concept. You really need to regulate yourself before you can regulate. And so we, we always want to be able to support ourselves or find that support if we're not currently. Yeah, that's how amazing that you're able to do that work. It's something that I feel like everybody should have a therapist. <laughs> you know, psychologists go to their home at the beginning because what you're saying is like you've been in very difficult situations. And, yeah. able to listen mm -hmm. to all that. and for somebody to come and help you during that moment, because it's different when you go in, into a session and you're like, oh, it's okay, baby's maybe sleeping. And you're like, <laughs> but to be able oh, to you're doing them, a great job. <laughs> yeah, be able to help them during that moment can be so empowering at the same time, because there's moms are a lot of them are sleep deprived. So mm -hmm. things are usually coming in, but it's like a much stronger Yeah. So as therapists, a lot of what we can do is just model. We're coming in with different resources, right? So I have more information about child development and I'm able to give that to a parent. And that's why we have a working relationship. But also I'm coming in, in with a different mindset. Like I'm here to support you. So you, you as the parent might be frantically trying to figure out what need, this baby needs, but I'm just trying to figure out what you need right now. So that really, as a therapist, it really provides something different for them. And I think that can be really great. Also, I wanted to mention that a lot of trauma is re-triggered when you're first becoming a parent, right? So I've worked with a lot of different parents and I've heard a lot of really impactful things. But I think one of the most impactful is that in the womb, they are super safe. And so it feels like you can absolutely protect them from any outside because they're only being harmed if you were being harmed and you can you know how to keep yourself. But once they're out in the world, it can feel really triggering and really different if you've had really traumatic. And so for new parents, it's important to look for the support that you're needing to process that trauma just so that you can be, well, just first so that you can be feel better and so that you don't get re-traumatized through parenting, but also so that we're not passing down this transgenerational trauma, right? So I mean, you've talked a lot about transgenerational trauma in your work. And so I'm sure the audience knows about that. Mm -hmm. But I think as it relates to infancy, it's really important because we want to like put the baby in context, right? Into our context and our world and our trauma so that we know how to best support that child and ourselves. I mean, I bump into it after I had my son because then I went through my whole <laughs> difficult yeah. stage like I was I heard about it before but it was not relevant until I went through it and it was like this dark stage and I'm like what's going on my logic mind wanted to understand and blah 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 and after two years that things started to stabilize I was like wow there's definitely stuff being passed down that I want to stop and in a way I feel like very grateful that I have like a second opportunity now that I have all this extra knowledge Yeah, to go through it again, but who knows how it's going to happen, you know, because every time is different. Yeah, but like yeah, yeah, but it's definitely something that a lot of parents don't know about this. This is something, again, that is not taught. Like people prepare so much for birth. Like lately, there's been a movement of preparing for birth. People take classes, but they're not preparing for postpartum. They're not. Mm -hmm. I remember like at the end of my pregnancy, I was like, wow. I want a nurse, but I don't have nursing shirts. Like after I had my son, I was like asking people, can you please go and buy them a Target and stuff like that? Because I was so prepared to that home birth and everything, but not to postpartum. Mm -hmm. And a birth, I mean, mine lasted like about 28 hours, but you know, whatever, two, three days if you're in labor and all that. But postpartum is, <laughs> is longer than that. Mm -hmm. It's a long healing journey. Yeah. And there are things that will come up um, almost for everybody. And there's also really positive things that come up, right? Oh, yeah. um, there's an interview called Angels in the Nursery. I don't know if you've heard of that interview mm -hmm. that a lot of therapists will use for child parent psychotherapy. And it's an article by, I think the author is Gosten, but they go through, there's this article that's psychoanalytic that's called Ghosts in the Nursery, right? And this is about the traumas that have come up that are, that are going to be triggered. But there's this other concept of angels in the nursery, which is about who who were the people you felt safest with. And what we want to do as therapists is take clients back to that feeling of security and safety and cultivate that so that they can cultivate that feeling as parents for their child. Yeah. And so we want to pass down these angels and kind of prevent the, the ghosts, right? So like the trauma, we want to kind of process and stop 
passing that down from generation to generation, but we want to keep the joys and keep the security and continue to pass that on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the parent child psychotherapy. I never was trained because I'm not zero to five, but I had coworkers and I thought it was so like one of the best models that I knew at that time for, mm -hmm. for this kind of stuff. And I know we kind of like answer some of these questions, but going back in terms of any other recommendation that you have for parents to prepare for baby and for the infancy stage? Um, yeah, so definitely creating a support system that is not just there for the baby, but also there for the mom birthing and also for the other partner. It's really important to have a support system for the entire system. So some people do like food trains where they have like a an array of people and they're bringing different foods for after the birth because no one has time to cook or clean usually. So really reaching out to your network and finding that support at that time. Also, of course, you want to prep your house and everyone talks a lot about that with all the baby stuff and like baby showers, they give you so much stuff. But I think the support is the most important and also finding someone to talk to during those transitional periods. And it can look really, it can look really different than typical therapy, right? So like I do home visits and I do a lot of parent coaching in home just so that the support is coming to you and so that it is created for postpartum. We as therapists shouldn't require people to be coming into our office when they have just finished giving birth. If parents are needing support, um, I think it's most helpful as therapists to offer that support in because they obviously like can't be driving or they're having so much going on that they're just needing the support to come to them. So it's important to offer that as well. Yes, so important. My therapist was coming at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. at yeah. What are some of the books or resources that parents can benefit from? Yeah, one of my favorites is The Emotional Life of a Toddler. So this book really talks about temperament and how basically each baby is born with their own personality. And so how to embrace that personality and how to work with it as well. So sometimes the personality or the temperament of the child won't match the temperament of a parent. And so how do we navigate that, right? So if a parent is really calm and likes really quiet environments, but the child is really active and is constantly moving, how do we create a dance that they can both vibe to, right? So we really want to be able to cultivate that. And the author is Alicia Lieberman, and she does a really good job of explaining how to work with that. Thank you. Um, another book is called No Drama Discipline by Dan Siegel. And that's for a little bit more like the four or five-year-old, but it's just how to discipline in general with more of the positive parenting strategies and how to connect with the child before he causes redirect them. So we're not necessarily using a lot of punishment or like consequence type of language, but we're using more connection to guide the child. Okay. And then the last one is Touch Points by Barry Brazelton. And that's all about infancy and attachment and how to cultivate the secure attachment with your child. Never heard of that one. Could you repeat the author? Uh, Barry Brazelton. So he was on the board of Zero to Three, which is an organization that focuses on the mental health of children ages zero to five. So he passed away recently, I want to say within the last two years, and all his work is really amazing. So he's written a lot of articles and a lot of books that are really helpful in understanding early infancy. Anything else that you feel like you want to share before we go into like where people can find you and all that good stuff? Yeah, Zero to Three does have a website called zero to three dot org. And they have a lot of very like easy to read articles about feeding and sleep and potty training and all of the things that are helpful between ages zero to five. So I think that that's a good resource to have. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that we covered everything. So where can people find you? So I have a private practice in Burbank and Montrose where I work with children and families. And I also do individual work with a lot of new parents mostly. And on Instagram, my handle is Dr. Christine Rivera. Um, my email is listed there as well as my phone. If anyone wants to reach out and consult or have services. And in your private practice, do you also do home visits or is that more? Yes, in my private practice, I also do home visits. And what are the areas that you cover? Right now I'm covering Burbank, Glendale, Montrose. Okay, good to know. Yeah, because people might be hearing you from Taurus <laughs> or somewhere yeah. else, you know. Yeah, <laughs> traffic. And traveling is involved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. LA is rough. 
Well, Dr. Christine, thank you so much for giving us all this great information. And I hope that this was so helpful for everyone that's listening, not only from parents or future parents, but also thinking from a inner child perspective about healing in terms of like maybe how was your infant state? Because a lot of people kind of go more into, they're just, there's a term that I learned in Spanish and right now I can't even remember. Tabula rasa. Oh, I remember. Tabula rasa, which is kind of like they're just an empty board that you're just feeding into this empty board, but they, they're not that way. Mm-hmm. Research and all these understandings have changed that children are interacting with us and they have their temperament and they have a lot of things already and they're communicating. When I said not talking, but they're communicating via their crying, their movements and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's such an important topic and episode and I'm so grateful to have you. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So fun to talk to you and talk about these concepts. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Beyond Resilience Life podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. If you like this episode, please make sure to review it and comment on it and share it with your friends and family. Until next time.